we're on the air. Here we go. We are this close, this close, people, to finding out this year's Super Bowl matchup. We cannot wait. I'm going to bring you the best information, the best of the best on the four teams. Marissa Contepelli with Cincinnati. BJ Kissel joining us with the Chiefs side of things. Stats got us. Stats. That's got us covered on the Niners side. And Philly legend, we're honored to have John Clark on the Eagles side, uh, giving us all of the info. These are the people that are with the teams right now. Today, they'll be with them. They were with them yesterday. They know the vibes. They know the latest injury reports. Hayden Hurst randomly injured. we got to get into that. And speaking of Philadelphia and John Clark, uh, Boston Scott is an absolute Giants killer. Can he be a Niners killer? I ask him, and he joins the show in a bit. I cannot wait. I love him. And it's Friday, so you know what you're getting. You're getting K-Makers. I got two beers, apparently, to choose from. Uh, Brian Barton, my great producer, gave me weekend vibes, which I appreciate. And he gave me this because he thinks whatever this monstrosity is, it looks like a bangle. Your thoughts on Twitter. Let's go. That, that, that looks like a tiger. That looks like uh, the, the DC comic guy. No, is it a hell? It says Hellcat, Brew Dog Hellcat. So if you put a Brew Dog and a Hellcat together, do you get a Cincinnati Bengal? Those are the questions we answer here on Up and Adams. We are so excited, just two sleeps away from action on Championship Weekend, uh, and we got to talk about a couple of these things because uh, I'm a little nervous. I found out that I have to fly to Dallas for work on Sunday, in and out of Dallas. Okay, and there's a chance. I know my producer's like, really? Yeah. There's a chance that I might miss the start of the Niners game, the Niners-Eagles game. I've never been in this sort of situation with a high-stakes game. What do y'all do when your kid has a soccer game and you need to watch the big... Do you not... Do you turn Twitter off? Is your phone off so nobody texts you? And you... you do I have to learn how to use a TiVo and be able to record it or whatever? Richard's saying watch my phone, but I'm actively working. It's not like I'm sitting... In the back. So you're at the soccer game watching your kids, watching the game while your kids trying to score goals out there? I couldn't do that. What's the plan, though? I'm serious. You guys, let me know. Uh, do I have to learn how to record the game? Do I say I don't have to watch it? I'll follow along on Twitter. I've done that with some regular season games. So I'm all out of sorts here. Help me out. At Up and Adam Show. At Hey K Adams. What do I do if I'm set to miss some of that first game? On Sunday. Now, yesterday I did provide you with some game changers in the NFC Championship game. We talked about Niners defensive coordinator uh, D'Amico Ryans. We talked about Eagles tight end Dallas Goddard. And today I want to hit you with the AFC side of things. And let's start with the Chiefs. And I'm going to say that the game changer here that's going to have an effect is the decision making of general manager Brett Veach. And I know he won't be out there battling to win this thing dressed up on Sunday, but in order for the Chiefs to pull this off, it's the bold moves of Veach and what he did this off season. And those guys that he added, the rookies especially, that need to ball out and continue to pay off. Listen, it's one thing to build a good team and win a Super Bowl. And it's another thing to be able to sustain any sort of level of dominance in this NFL and go to five straight AFC title games when you're dealing with Injuries, roster turnover, your star player is having to get paid year after year after year with the salary cap. So you have to make really tough decisions as a GM. I could never do it. I would never want to do it. He had to make the decision. Think about it. Brett Beach is at his table. He's got his probably like customized stationery, his personalized stuff. And he's sitting there. He's got like eight TVs on and all the channels. And he's like watching highlights, too, of Tyreek Hill and saying, um... I think it's in the best interest of this team and what we want to do to deal away the cheetah. Those are the decisions that end up defining you, your legacy, and your success in this league. Do you want to be a legend? Do that. Get rid of Tyreek Hill and play for a chance to be in the Super Bowl. Listen to Veach back in April talking about his philosophy heading into the draft in the aftermath, of course, of said Tyreek trade. I think it's... Uh, we've shown every every indication of you know where we're going with this thing, and we're going to build for the draft, and, and having 12 picks and having flexibility year in and year out is something um, that we're certainly putting a lot of stock in. And, and like I said, we're excited to add uh, talent on both sides of the football and, and work through the draft and, and get young and, and get deep. And in theory, it's all good and well. Great theory. Of course, we're going to do it. But in order for that to work, you have to nail draft picks. Nailing draft picks, that's so hard to do. And you have to use that flexibility to make really savvy free agent additions. So as we know, that's way easier said than done. But it's exactly what that guy who does for talking did and accomplished. So let's start with the draft picks. Bring them up here. 
This is outrageous. This draft class has combined to start 66 games. KC hasn't allowed a 300-yard passer since McDuffie's been healthy. Karloftis has six sacks and has emerged as one of the best young pass rushers in the entire NFL. Jalen Watson, he has two interceptions that have been two of the biggest plays of this Chiefs season. Those three rookies are full-time starters, and they're going to have a big hand in trying to slow down Joe Burrow on Sunday. And let's not forget about their last pick in the draft, Isaiah Pacheco. Ajay Pacheco is everywhere now. He's completely taken over the backfield. So we've seen teams, you know, they're, let's get a lot of draft picks and turn it into something. And it turns into a big fat zero, nothing. In year one, Veach's group has already made a massive impact in getting this team to another AFC championship. It is so impressive. It's crazy. And then Veach talked about having flexibility. So let's see what he did with that flexibility. None of these moves made national headlines, but none of them broke the bank either. And they've all made this team better and, and significantly. I think the Chiefs have the most depth on any team in the NFL right now. We're not even talking about it. The most depth. And it's really in thanks to Veach's ability to completely retool, refigure, recalibrate this roster without sacrificing um, the ability to contend out the gate. It has been so brilliant. So we'll see which one of the new additions pays off uh, the most on Sunday. And if, if they're, you know, enough, to, any one of those guys or all three of those guys together, four of those guys, if they can get KC to another Super Bowl, um, that would be insane and super impressive. And I just hope everyone's sort of paying attention to that. I gave Howie Roseman his love. So I felt like, man, Brent Beach really needs his flowers when we were looking into it earlier this week. So let's bring in somebody who knows these Chiefs better than anyone, the brains behind Kansas City Sports Network, BJ Kissel. Am I wrong, Brent Beach, baby? No, I don't think you're wrong at all. I think he doesn't get enough credit uh, for what he did. And even a couple of years ago, and, and information you just brought was fantastic, but even a couple of years ago after that loss to Tampa Bay, offensive line being a problem in that game, the way that he completely revamped the Chiefs' offensive line in one offseason, drafting Creed Humphrey and drafting mm -hmm. Trey Smith and signing Joe Tooney. He's done it before. We saw it happen again uh, this offseason and what they've got from this rookie class. It's just been special to watch. And has really set them up from a roster composition standpoint, drafting Jalen Watson and Trent McDuffie, rookies on rookie cornerbacks on rookie deals, I should say, uh, and not having to pay those guys in free agency allows you so much roster flexibility and free agency over the next few years that this thing is really set up to be pretty special for what the Chiefs are able to accomplish even after the last five years in the five straight AFC championship games. It's so true. And I, I'll, I'll be the first one to say and be honest that when that Tyreek Hill trade <laughs> happened, I was like, oh, I don't know, man. Leaving it to the draft, that is a crapshoot. You never know how it's going to work out. And it completely has been in just incredible. KC is an 83-28 and 28 record in Beach's six seasons, okay, guys? Six AFC West titles, five AFC title appearances, like BJ is saying. All right, now, BJ, 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 we have seen <laughs> the grainy gym photos. We've seen the zoom-ins on his feet. James Palmer on NFL Network redoing the walk, all of this. Press conferences, all that. Uh, from from who you've talked to in the sense you're getting, how much of a factor will the high ankle sprain be for Mahomes on Sunday? I don't think we can pretend that it's not going to be some kind of a factor. It's just going to be interesting to see how Patrick Mahomes can kind of hold himself back or protect that ankle. I was watching a replay of the AFC Championship game from last year, and there were a handful of plays, especially in the first half that Mahomes made where he was turning and twisting and doing all those crazy plays that we see outside the pocket. And I just don't know if he's going to be able to do the same thing. But I've been saying all week on KC Sports Network that you give Andy Reid eight days to prepare and game plan, knowing the variables that are going to be there. Trust in the fact that he's going to have a game plan that's going to find success at some level for the Chiefs offense. But it's be really interesting to see, especially early, the first few times that maybe the first or second reads taken away and he tries to escape the pocket. Do we see the the ankle cause any kind of an issue there or does Mahomes try to protect himself a little bit there by just going down and not putting himself in a position to take a hit like he did against Arden Key and the Jags last yeah. week uh, because you've talked to Patrick Mahomes before K I know that telling him not to play the game the way that he's always played it it's going to be interesting that mental side versus the physical and kind of how they play that out but I trust Andy Reid will have something dialed up uh, as a way for the Chiefs offense to find some success against a, a very very good Bengals defense. I do too and you know if this was any, if he was less than 100%, everyone's always saying, oh, one-legged uh, Mahomes is better than anyone. If it was against any <laughs> team in the AFC West, sure, I wouldn't even be worried. But this Bengals team, for whatever reason, and you can give me your thoughts on it, they've consistently been able to get the better of the Chiefs. It's crazy. What do you attribute that to, and what does KC have to do differently? 
I think it's simple. They they made plays at the end of the game when it counted. Uh, the Chiefs didn't do that. We saw, especially last year in the AFC title game, the second half it was probably one of the worst halves that we've seen from this Chiefs team under Andy Reid. And every game that the Chiefs have lost, there's been so much talk and so many things that have been said this week between the fan bases and all that. The Chiefs have had leads in the second half. They haven't been getting blown out. And so this the Chiefs are getting dominated and all that. I don't believe that that's the case, but the Bengals have definitely made plays when it counted late in the game. The Chiefs had opportunities in that game. Chris Jones talked about it at the end of last season or after they lost the AFC title game. He talked about it at training camp that he let, he feels like he personally left a lot of plays out on the field that he should have made. And that was the difference. And the, the Bengals made those plays. And Lou Anaromo may have the best game plan that we've mm-hmm. seen against Andy. Andy Reid with so many guys that are used defensively for those Bengals players. They're used so well to their strengths that it's definitely going to be a battle. All of the games have been close. Expect this one to be close. I'm really curious on the chess match of the, the ankle situation and how do the Chiefs call it and how do the Bengals try and play uh, schematically against that, knowing he might not get outside the pocket and do some of those things that have kind of come to define what we've seen from Patrick Mahomes throughout his career. You're right. Coach Lou just has a knack for this. He did it to Josh Allen. He's like high-powered, amazing uh <laughs> quarterbacks he just like is a bit of a nightmare for them uh casey sports network you're outside somewhere where are and where where are what is casey sports network up to right now so i'm actually in las vegas right now covering the east west shrine cool. bowl we uh we're out here doing the nfl draft content we pride ourselves at casey sports network having phenomenal draft content and because it just so happens that this event happens right before the afc championship we brought our whole crew out here there's Whoa. seven of us out here uh covering the the shrine bowl interviewing players uh for the next few days while also covering the afc championship so we've got we're pretty busy right now but it's a lot of fun love coming out here it's a great event and yeah should be a lot of fun and hopefully we have a good time on sunday watching the game together out here yeah there are so many I mean, there's podcasts. You've got all sorts of stuff going on. I mean, you're all over the media. Sports, it's not, it's not just a sports network, like a TV network, like multimedia, everything covered over at KC Sports Network with BJ Kissel. We appreciate you. And this is why you're ahead of the game, by the way. This is why you are the way you are, <laughs> because you're a sick pup who's at the, is in Vegas covering this game while you have the AFC Championship game. BJ, we appreciate you uh, and your perspective. Yep. And to put it, by the way, into perspective, this Bengals team in the past two years has three wins over the Chiefs. That is as many wins as the rest of the AFC West in that time. Really think about that. Three wins. Uh, and the A West against him over the, a six-year career is 27 and, 27 and three against the division. In six years, he has three. Can you really even think about that? What, can, what, what the Bengals sort of do to him and what he needs to do back to them? I don't know how this game is going to go, but I do know this. If the Bengals are going to make it four straight over Kansas City, they're going to need... A big effort from my personal game changer in this game, defensive end Trey Hendrickson. He has a bit of history against these Chiefs. In fact, no one has hit Patrick Mahomes more in his career than Trey Hendrickson. Do you you understand that that's a real? That's a real stat. That's a real thing. And the only other guys who have sacked and pressured him more are Joey Bosa and Max Crosby, who, of course, live and breathe in the AFC West and have faced him more often. So this history, I'm going to take you back because this matters. It goes back to Hendrickson's final year as a New Orleans Saint. 2020 showdown at the Superdome, okay? Trey got into it with the O-line. There's pointing. Hold on, wait wait for the pointing. Hendrickson's pointing. There's yelling. There it is. Where's the finger? Don't you talk. He does like this whole like Matumbo kind of thing. Uh, There's yelling. There's screaming. Cam Jordan got ejected in this game. Do you remember this game? And there was Trey racking up two sacks and five quarterback hits on the day. That's the most hits Mahomes has ever taken from a single player in the same game. But as you see here, it's not just the production. There's a tone that he sets out there, just like he did during last year's AFC Championship game. He racked up another sack and a half in that game, including this one with the score tied in the fourth quarter to force a Chiefs punt. Ow! That can't feel good, especially if your ankle's not feeling great. Now, whether Mahomes' mobility in this game is compromised because of that ankle or not, Trey Hendrickson, he's, as you can tell by looking at this footage, he will make his presence felt in that backfield. And I would be shocked if we don't see him get home and make at least one huge play given the history here. I don't know what, sometimes there's no rhyme or reason to it. Sometimes it's just the way it is. Trey Hendrickson versus Mahomes, very successful, very impactful, and not somebody Mahomes is excited to face on Sunday at 
Borough head, is it, Marissa? Let's bring her in here. Let's bring in Cincy's team reporter and senior producer, who I love. Congratulations on the uh, second trip to the AFC Championship game. Marissa Contepelli, how are you? Hey, doing fantastic. And I think we do. Uh, it is Burrow Head. That's Mike Hilton's kind of trademarked that now. So, I mean, why not roll with it? Yes. It's Mike, man, I saw that. I see he was mic'd up. It was hilarious. Him and T. Higgins. I just saw that uh, uh, on your social feeds over there with the Bengals. It was incredible. Now, you were along for the magical run last year. And as great as that team was, almost everyone I have talked to says that it's, it's even better. DJ Reader says we're a better team. We have even more chemistry. What's the biggest difference you've noticed from last year to now? Hey, it's the standard. Um, this team is expected to be in these type of games, these type of moments. Last year, they had the confidence, but they were still really pegged as the underdog. Bengals weren't supposed to be there last year. They were a year early. They were playing with house money. And so, yeah, last year's run was so magical. Obviously, it fell, fell short in the Super Bowl. But this year has been a completely different tone in the locker room. Um, the, the confidence is the highest I have seen it in my five years being here in Cincinnati now. Every single player I've talked to, um, this is the expectation. And a lot of it comes from Joe Burrow's swagger. I mean, you listen to him during his post-game press conferences, just talking about the way he says, the Super Bowl is his entire window of his career. Um, you just you, when you have that from your coming from your quarterback, it's going to trickle down into everyone else. And I feel like we've even seen it from Zach Taylor at times um, when he was kind of taking his little kind of sarcastic um, edge during his postgame presser uh, after the Bills win. So it's just the different type of swagger and confidence. Um, you know, it's made all the difference this year, Kay. Uh, I mean, and yeah, the, it, it, you have to have swagger when you're on a 10 game win streak. It's the longest in Brand Bengals franchise history, and it's all the momentum leading into a matchup where they've taken care of business three three times uh, and looking for their fourth win. The O-line played so well in Buffalo last week. I was surprised, guilty. I was like, Andrew Whitworth, first-class flight, 4D on a Delta, get your ass to Cincinnati and let's make this thing happen. Uh, but, but the reality of it is this week's a bit of a different story. Casey's pass rush, really, really intense. Is there any sense that we will see John Williams, Alex Kappa, both one or the other back in the mix this weekend? Well, first off, I absolutely loved Witt's response to your tweet, how he's saying this, you know, old man, Bengals don't need him. You got to love Witt, right? Yeah, right. Um, but honestly, Kay, the offensive line, I think, surprised all of us. I mean, the fact that Joe Burrow was only sacked one time in that game for just a two-yard loss was just absolutely incredible. And and it starts with Frank Pollock and just the leadership he has had in that room. We had some great sideline sound that we captured of him, uh, you know, talking to his players, just how proud he was of those guys stepping up. Um, today's going to be a big day because neither Jonah Williams or Alex Kappa has practiced yet this week. So the team's um, going to be heading out for practice here um, in about uh, an hour or so. And so we'll have a little bit better of idea then in terms of if they're able to practice or not, because Fridays are typically a big day. Um, if they don't practice, it's going to be tough to see them actually suiting up on Sunday um, but I mean, the way that those guys stepped in with Max Sharping and Jackson mm -hmm. Carmen, Jackson Carmen looked so natural out there at left tackle. Of course, that's where he was at Clemson. So like you said, Casey's uh, front is a little bit stronger than what Buffalo is bringing. I mean, just those guys that they have there up there is absolutely loaded. But Joe Burrow's been getting the ball out quick. And if they can get the run game, um, you know, going once again with Mixon, it's going to give them a little bit more flexibility there. I give them a lot of credit. I said all their names and we can celebrate these boys because unbelievable job at this offensive line. Hopefully they can keep it going. I also gave a lot of love this week to who I named as my game changer. Marissa, for this game, Hayden Hurst. He balled out against Buffalo when he was, uh, I saw him on the injury report and I went, <gasps> what is going on? Limited calf issue. What's my concern level? Right. Well, it, it took a lot of us by surprise when he popped up there. Um, and so we'll get to talk to Zach more today when they're coming off the field. But I would say it's encouraging that the fact that he was just limited. Uh, we know that he had a calf issue just about a month ago, missed a little bit of time from that. But um, I'm not reading too much into it yet. Uh, again, we'll, we'll know more once we talk to Zach, but the injury report kind of came out after we had already talked to Zach yesterday. So it'll be, it'll be seen here coming up here soon. But I mean, Hayden Hurst, love, love, love that he is with this team. He has just been such a boost. Um, just, he, is it that, just some physical type of presence that he has, Kay? I mean, it's like a Viking out there. I don't know. Yeah. It's just been absolutely great just to have him, um, what he brings to this offense. And how can you not love just like everything he had gone through in his career to finally 
you know, be fitting in with a team. He talked so highly of the Spangles coaching staff and just how uh, wanted and um, how appreciated he is to this team. So it's just been such a big boost having Hayden around. It is, and he's an emotional. I mean, he's a monster out there. Touchdown career high, 59 yards last week, and then he's out there as this emotional uh, leader with a bit of a score to settle. People want to brush it under the rug. DJ Reader's like, Dustin Reed's my friend. I thought nobody's talking about it. <laughs> but, you know, Hayden Hurst said himself, I, had, I don't have a short memory. I don't mm -hmm. have a long memory, and he has a bit of a, a bit of a something out that I need him out there because he didn't get to play fully the the last time these two squads met. So uh, we appreciate your time. We you have so much. You're not only covering this team, you're producing, you're doing it all. Marissa Contepelli, we thank you, appreciate you, and hopefully we talk to you soon. Thank you, Kay. Thank mm -hmm. you, thank you to Marissa Contepelli and BJ Kissel. We've got stats on fire coming up. New podcast, baby. New and approved podcast for my boy Stats. Welcome back to the Up and Adam Show. The Niners headed to Philly to take on the Eagles. Let's break down this game with an absolute legend from NBC Sports in Philadelphia, the great John Clark coming to us. Are you at NovaCare right now? I am at the NovaCare Complex in Philly. We were just out at practice, but you can only watch that for like five, ten minutes, and then they want you out because they're going to actually go through their plays. Mm. So now I'm in my car because it's a little cold out here. Yeah, a little, I looked at the weather, 40 degrees. Listen, I, I, it's, I'm in California, it's about 75, and I've got a space heater right here, so I feel you, and I hope you're keeping warm. You look great. We're all excited for this game. You had five minutes in there. Give me the energy, and what were you looking at? What were you zeroed in on? Like, everybody zeroed on, in on Mahomes' ankle. Well, yeah, so I think with the Eagles, it's Lane Johnson. Mm. Lane Johnson is arguably their best player. They win when Lane Johnson's on the field, and he's got that torn groin, something or other down there. I don't want to get too oh specific, but yeah, it, it's amazing that he's actually playing through this because he told me that he was sore coming out of the game, but he's a warrior. He's going through this. He's playing through injury and that offensive line, I believe is the best in football. So when you have Lane Johnson able to play out there, gave up no pressures against the giants. So he played fantastic. That is going to go a long way to uh, get this offense going against, you know, best defense in the league. It is the best defense in the league. I talked to Boston Scott. He'll be on the show in just a little bit. And he gave so much credit to that offensive line and Lane Johnson, all those veteran leaders, for keeping them going. He also was gushing about Jalen Hurts and his journey. And Hurts was asked to reflect on that uh, ahead of this NFC Championship game. And he said, quote, it's, oh, sorry, but had it. it's not uh, the time for me to reflect on that because I'm not done. So what stands out to you with his growth as you've covered him as a leader and a player? Okay, it's really unbelievable because he's 24. And yet he is more mature than I am, let's say. And, and it's amazing because he leads this team at the age of 24. And you've got veterans like Jason Kelsey, Fletcher Cox, Brandon Graham, Lane Johnson, who have been mm -hmm. here, won a Super Bowl. He comes in and things he says, like, we got to make daily deposits. The rent is due every day. You start <laughs> to hear other players say the same thing. So he is the unquestionable leader of this team. And here at the NovaCare Complex, guys say they see his car when they come in at 7 a.m. So he's here, whatever, 5, 6 a.m. He's here at night going over the game plans and the installation of the game plan, like 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night. He lives and breathes football, and he wants to be great. He wants to be the best, and he doesn't feel there's any reason why he can't. It's almost like hmm. Tom Brady. Tom Brady gets drafted late round, kind of looked over, right? Well, nobody could see what was inside of him and his will and his desire to be great, and Jalen does it every single day. I think he's 24-7 football. I really do. And we love hearing it, and he's going to need it up against the number one defense. But I will say they're 20th against the pass. And the way that Jalen looked against the Giants, I wouldn't be surprised if him to AJ, him to Devante, him to Goddard is going to play a huge factor and be able to carve up and get some points on the board against this squad. I want to ask you about the, the, the other side of the ball with the Niners. Rookie quarterback, Brock Purdy. This is a new kid. He's not flashy. He doesn't make a lot of turnovers. He's thrown 16 touchdowns, just three interceptions in his last eight here. What's the key for this defense to forcing Purdy into making mistakes? Well, that's that's going to be the key, in my opinion. You said it. And I think the key is the Eagles, if they can slow down the run, because I think the 49ers are going to want to come out here. They're going to want to establish the run, get Christian McCaffrey in space as well uh, through quick passes. But if they can slow down the run, then, as they say here, they earn the right to rush the passer because you want them to be in third and eight, third and nine, third and ten. You want to slow down the run. So then 
with this crowd here, it is going to be so loud at the link. I don't think Brock Purdy's ever seen anything like it. It's going to be really hard for the offensive line, Brock Purdy, to communicate. Even the Eagles last week said they couldn't hear on the offensive line when they're on offense. So imagine when the Eagles' defense is out yeah. there. So if the Eagles' defense gets that extra half a second, one-third of a second, and they're able to get past the 49ers' line, they're going to hit Brock Purdy. I mean, 39 sacks over the last seven games. So I don't think Brock is going to see, hasn't seen this kind of pressure yet. And they've got they've got a rotation where they can just keep these veterans, the older guys, fresh, and they don't need to play as many snaps. Yeah, I mean, it worked against Tom Brady, didn't it? Sounds like the same kind of waves of pass rush from back in that game. We appreciate you. He is John Clark from NBC Sports in Philadelphia, a legend. One of my favorite producers on the show, John, I must say, is obsessed with you. And, and so I, we are also obsessed with you. Get out of your car. Enjoy the rest of practice and, uh, and all the work that you do at NBC Sports. We appreciate the time. And let's get to the Niner side of things now. Uh, they are, as a franchise, going to this game for the 18th time in history. History, and who better to bring in from the Gold Standard 49ers Podcast Network, Rob Stansko Ferreira! What's up, Kay? Hey, what's going on? Okay, so it's been a while. I haven't talked to you in a bit, and you were with SB Nation. They are, did, made a dumb decision, and now you have a whole <laughs> other thing. I feel like I talked to you three days ago. Now you've got a new gig. What's happening? Well, you know... Decisions get made, and, and we're not going anywhere, so we started a new podcast, the Gold Standard 49ers Podcast Network. It's on Apple. It's on Spotify. It's everywhere you get your podcasts. We got to keep it going because the Niners are in the NFC Championship game for the sixth time in the last 12 years, Kay. It's true. You got quite a streak going there, and you got a lot of listeners, and a lot. I listen to that podcast a lot, so I'm so glad that we're av you're available uh, somewhere else. It's the Gold Standard 49ers Podcast Network. We will plug it. We are happy you're taking the time for us. I know you've got stats on fire. You're, you've got a lot of stuff going on, but and we also know that you have issues with Kyle Shanahan, okay? <laughs> And I thought about you during this game last week, and I said, oh, Stats is going to be so pissed at how conservative he's being. It was, squeak, it was squeaky tight, tight little 19-12 win over the Cowboys. What's your concern level with him in this matchup? My concern is he's not going to be aggressive enough because I think both teams are going to try and run the ball. Both teams are going to try and limit the number of possessions that the other team gets. And so... Whereas I think Nick Sirianni is going to be willing to go for it on mm -hmm. fourth down, especially in the red zone. Mm -hmm. He's going to go for touchdowns and Kyle's going to go for field goals. And I just don't know in a game that I think is going to be close if that's the strategy you need to have. Okay, so let's play psychologist. Nothing scarier than Stats and K playing. Like, where does the scar tissue come from from him? Is it more? Because that's what it is, right? It's psychological, his conservative behavior. It is. I'm sure he trusts Brock Purdy, but he gets like this in these moments. Is it 28 to 3? Is it Super Bowl 54? What is it? Because we need to get you to get, get that stuff needs to exit your mind. We need ayahuasca this thing out of there. Puke a bunch, I, Kyle. He, I think it's all of it. I think he coaches to avoid things rather than someone like Nick Sirianni who coaches to achieve yeah. things. The Eagles have converted more fourth downs this year than the 49ers have even attempted. And I think that Kyle just looks at it like if we can just avoid the big turnover, if we can avoid going down by multiple scores, then we'll be OK. I'll figure it out down the stretch. But again, I don't think that's the attitude you can have when you're going up against that defense. You're on the road and you might only get a few possessions to score points. It's a great point, Stats. And Let's talk about this part of it. The, you know, the, the balanced attack is what you want to do. You want to go in there like you did last year and say, we want to run the ball, like you said. Let's have Christian McCaffrey just do this thing. Brock, Brock Purdy, you just be cute, do the thing, manage the game, whatever. I talked to Hall of Famer Chris Carter about this on Monday, and I said, what do you make of Brock? What will have to do the rest of the day? Can they keep doing this? And he said, you can't hide your quarterback. You can maybe one game. and You can't hide him. There will be a point in this game, and you just heard John Clark, a, a legend covering this Eagles team, saying at some point, it'll be an inevitability, a la Jimmy Garoppolo, where you're going to have to step up, kid, and make a play. Are you convinced that he has it? Well, Party. to hear John talk, you know, I, I, I don't know how the 49ers could ever hope to win this game <laughs> going up against that great Eagles team. No, I think that Brock does have it. If there's one thing that he has shown, he's not afraid to make the plays that are there. Now, does that mean he's running around like Patrick Mahomes? No. 
But Jimmy Garoppolo couldn't even make the plays that were there. And I feel like they did try and hide Jimmy Garoppolo down the stretch. Mm -hmm. They are not trying to do that with Brock Purdy. Kyle trusts Brock more than Jimmy Garoppolo, which is crazy to say because Brock's only started seven games, but it's true. So I honestly believe that if he has to step up and make a play, he will. I love that. I mean, he's undefeated, right? 7-0. and I'm looking at his numbers here. 18 touchdowns to four interceptions. Now the Niners, they're facing Jalen Hurts. You can say what you want about John Clark. Jalen Hurts is the real deal, okay? He's one of the best quarterbacks. Yeah. You don't think he is? Well, here's my question. All these sort of playoff questions that we have about Brock, about Brock Purdy, don't they also apply to Jalen Hurts? Uh, I mean, they've played the same number of playoff games. Brock Purdy actually has more playoff wins than Jalen Hurts. I feel like people are treating Hurts like he's a known commodity, and I don't think that he is. And let me just say this. I've seen Jalen Hurts get benched in a championship game, and Tua Tungavailoa had to come in and throw the game-winning touchdown pass. Well, Tua ain't there for you this time, Jalen. So let's see it this weekend <laughs> against the best defense you're going to face all year. It, it definitely is that. And Boston Scott's going to be on the show in a little bit. Or we're going to bring you the conversation I had with him. And he talks a lot about that, about what this defense is. But they've got playmakers on that side, too. And this is, you know, he's, he's definitely one of the best running quarterbacks uh, in, in the National Football League of what he can do. Uh, I think they're really well coached. I think it's a huge, I think they have a coaching advantage in all the ways that you're talking about because it is who's going to who who has the cojones to make a huge play when they need to do that. Uh, but I mean, is there a defensive player you can at least give me that you think will be a difference maker in stopping Jalen Hurts and making you look smart and him look silly? I think it's going to be Talano Hufanga, the safety for the 49ers. One way or another, he's going to be a huge factor in this game. If he plays his best game, he can be an absolute game wrecker. That interception against the Rams, that sealed the game. He wasn't even supposed to be guarding that guy. He just sniffed it out and made a play for the touchdown. He can absolutely wreck games in the passing game and in the running game, anticipating the snap count and just getting into the backfield immediately. The unfortunate thing for the Niners is, he can also take the cheese a little bit and crash in and try mm. and make a sack on a quarterback or disrupt a play when he's not supposed to, and he can get burned with play-action passes and deep passes down the field. So one way or another, I think he's going to be a factor in the game, but if he gives an A-plus performance, that'll make a massive difference. He's 23 years old, first-team All-Pro. So impressive, Huvanga is, and we'll see if he can do that. That was my take. Jalen Hurts, meh, is he? Is he that good? Make sure you check out Rob's work and his new podcast is the Gold Standard 49ers Podcast Network over at YouTube. You have stats on fire as well. Please come back, would you please? Well, after they win, let's hope. You're the best. Or when they lose, which is more fun for me. <laughs> Stick around for more right here on a Friday. Up and Adams appreciate so much stats. Marissa Contepelli, BJ Kissel, John Clark. Uh, and upcoming right after this, my conversation with giant killer, maybe niner killer, Boston Scott. You love to crush the hearts of the New York tri-state area. What do you have against New York? <laughs> Okie dokie. Giants Nation saying personally not prepared for playoff Boston Scott and they were not. And he again just took it to them. My goodness. He just crushes that Giants team. I sat down with Boston Scott. He is the epitome of a guy that you want in your locker room. He, he's got a smile. You're not going to want to stop watching this interview just even because of that. He talks about Jalen Hurts. He talks about his coach. And he really embraces his role within this organization. And this team embraces him right back. Sorry, my dog's making a fuss. Hey. Can we see the dog? Well, obviously, uh -huh. I need to see the dog. I need a, a proper introduction. Uh -huh. Who is this? This is Dax. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. thought you were going to say Dak, and I was like, that's a whole other thing. We got to no. <laughs> Hand off, Boston Scott, four, touchdown, Boston Scott. Too strong. You love to crush the hearts of the New York tri-state area. You love killing the Giants. How are you feeling after that win? I'm feeling good, man. You know, obviously, what it's all about is getting to the next game. It doesn't really matter who the team is. You know, we're playing, it's playoff football, so the you know we're getting that win that's really all that matters boston you're you're full of it i, I can't even <laughs> even let this go on i know i know and i want to talk about the play you've got 11 touchdowns in nine <laughs> career games against the Giants. you've never played the giants and not scored a touchdown against them so let's not pretend that that's not amazing and let's at least revel in that for a little bit goes dynamic boston scott and he plows his way into the end zone and into the heart 
hats of Philadelphia Eagle fans for all time. What do you have against New York? <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's just a matter of opportunity. You know, I'd like to say, I believe in myself and my and my ability as a player, you know, and I believe that, you know, if I'm out there and I'm able to play, I get better each rep and I'm on the field. So, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily who's out there. It's just a matter of opportunity. Well, the numbers don't lie. And yeah, yeah. Sure I have a feeling your coach has a lot more to say. Sirianni's like jumping on the bench. He's get he's looking the camera dead in the lens. Nobody does that. He's in the end zone getting yelled at saying, I know what the rules are. I know where I can be. I know what I'm doing. How has he evolved in your eyes from the first time you heard his name, this is going to be the head coach, when you met him until right now when you're one game from the big game? It's just a matter of comfortability. You know what I mean? Like last year was our, you know, the first year. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of things that we have to learn. There's a lot of things that we have to establish. You know, development doesn't just apply to, you know, players. It can apply, it can apply to coaches. It can apply to all of us. So he's always had... Energy is always had juice. You know what I'm saying? Whenever you have people, oh, this is the great team, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, if you have bad times last year, like, oh, this team is, you know, whack. You know, oh, oh Jalen Hurts ain't this, he ain't that. You know, what are we going to do at the court? You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to learn how to clap for yourself. You got to learn how to believe in yourself, you know, so that that can that can sustain you throughout the season. You know, you're not up and down. You know what I'm saying? You're staying even killed. Sirianni's like next level out of 10. And then you have Jalen, who's cool as can be, cool cat, cold, whatever. And then confidence is what sort of bridges the gap between the two of them. What impresses you most about your quarterback? Just his story, man, his his journey to get to where he is. You know, I know what it's like to be the underdog. I know what it's like to be overlooked. I know what it's like to lose a job, you know what I'm saying, in, in football. And so it's hard whenever, you know, the view of your goal becomes blurry. You learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about yourself as a man, you learn a lot, a lot about yourself as a person. And so, you know, one of the, I feel like one of the defining things for, for Jay is, you know, Carson had the starting gig or whatever. Um, even though he wasn't playing, even though he didn't know if he was going to be playing or if he was going to be a part of the game plan, like every either Thursday or Friday, he would spend time out after everybody was off the field going through the entire game plan, going through his progressions, going through his throws before he even had packages in the game plan. Like he was still, you know, he was still carrying himself like that. And I would peep stuff like that. He had that vision for himself. And regardless of the of his circumstances, he didn't waver from that. I was getting fired up, you know, when people were talking about, you know, after last year, oh, uh, what's question mark, question mark at quarterback? What's this? What's that? Like, and I'm like, bro, y'all don't even know. It's dope, man. Just to see him be able to to rise to where he is now. I'm, I'm happy for him, but I'm not I'm not surprised. And you have all the confidence in the world and you can run, you can pass, you can block, your offense can do it all. But you haven't faced the number one defense in the league. And that's what this is going to take it all. It's going to take it all. It's the Niners. I'm sure you guys aren't having nightmares over there. But I would like to know, just honestly, what is the biggest challenge they present? To be honest, I feel like it's it's their speed. Like, their speed, man. I, I think that their speed is really... It's different. You know, obviously you see you see Fred Warner and cover two dropping back relating to the slot. Like he's he's running with CD Lamb down the field and makes a play down the field, which is pretty I mean, you see it, you know, you see it. And so um I think uh, as a unit, probably one of the more complete units that we've played. Um so it's gonna be a challenge. They're sound, they're coached really well. So you know, I know we got a big challenge in front of us, but you know, we got we got some dogs too. So like like Kelsey, it's the whole team. You know what I'm saying? Everybody, everybody wants to go hard, man. That's what it is, it's playoff football. So it's gonna be good on good, you know, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna fight, man, because that's what we love to do. Can Boston Scott become a 49er killer and bring all to the promised land? Hey, we're gonna see. We're gonna see. <laughs> you gotta clap for yourself. I know. I know. I know. Okay, so Marissa was an incredible producer. She's the biggest Eagles fan. Hey. Yeah. She's like, oh, baby. so you better yeah. do this thing at your house, at the link, and we're wishing you plenty of love. And do it for me and Marissa. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Give love to everybody. We appreciate you. Hi, right, Joe. 
I don't know if Marissa is happy with me or not happy with me that I pulled her on to that interview, but we were happy to talk to Boston Scott. Philly faces San Francisco this Sunday at 3.30 Eastern, one of the most anticipated matchups uh, of the entire season. Could Boston Scott be that guy? The Eagles need time, will certainly tell. And I'll be in Dallas, enemy territory for the Eagles, trying to figure out how to watch this game. How do I watch this game? What should I do? Let me know. And we'll be back uh, after this with Sam Munson still. And we got K-Makers after this. Don't go anywhere on a Friday. <laughs> Welcome back to the Evan Adam Show on a Friday. Time for Conference Championship Edition of... I need better, I need different music than this. I need something a little more aggressive than this. It's time for K-Makers. I'm going to give you three players who I think find the... Oh, oh, okay, okay. Okay, I feel that. Uh, three guys who are going to find the end zone this weekend. First up, I thought about this a lot. Do I not do Christian McCaffrey because it's so easy, or do I want to help you guys out? Christian McCaffrey, it's automatic. He has scored in eight straight games. I think it keeps it rolling, even up, uh, up against an Eagles defense that is pretty tough. Next, Dallas Goddard on the other side of this thing. I've called him my game changer for this one. He only has four touchdowns this year, but remember, he missed five games. He's found the end zone three of the last four games. He has played with Jalen Hurts. And finally, numero uno, Jamar Chase. He has scored in five of the last six. He's going to get in the end zone again this weekend. No question. Here we go. Here are my K-Makers. Anytime touchdown scores. Christian McCaffrey, Dallas Goddard, and Jamar Chase. Kansas City fans are going to kill me that I didn't pick one of their own. But we know Travis is going to get in the end zone. Calm down. All right. Let's do this. Sam Munson joining us from PFF. Time for some PFF up action with my guy here. Sam, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm wonderful. You do all things NFL over at PFF. Check out the new PFF app, guys, if you're getting set, set for championship weekend. Uh, do I drink this thing that they're saying looks like a bangle, even though I think it looks like a, a hellmouth, brew dog, hellcat? Or do I go with easy, like, weekend vibes, bro? No, it feels like you're definitely a weekend vibes kind of person. Oh, I was going to drink this one. Okay. All right, let's do this one. Okay, first up is the number seven. Okay, number seven. What do you got? Seven is the lowest rank that any of the Eagles offensive line, the five starters have at their respective position this year. So all five starters are essentially top 10 guys at their position this season. It's the best offensive line in the NFL. We saw the difference that Lane Johnson made to it last week when he's back, even though he's not 100% battling through that injury. They've got five guys and not one of them is even close to a weakness this year. It's so true. John Clark was just at practice. He works for NBC Sports there in Philly. They gave him five minutes to take a look, and his eyes were on Lane Johnson the whole time. Says he looks great. Hopefully they get, get, they get it going. The Eagles rushed for 268 yards in that win over the Giants. Hertz was sacked just once, and we hope that continues. Seven, by the way. Also the number of losses Eric Weddle has against the Bengals in his career. Ouch. Ouch. <sighs> All right, the number... 25.7. 25.7 sounds like the forecasted temperature in Kansas City on Sunday because Burrowhead's going to be chilly. That is the percentage of opposing drives that end in some kind of score for the San Francisco 49ers. That is by far the best number in the NFL for any defense. It's like five percentage points better than anybody else. This is the number one defense in the NFL. They've shown it in a variety of different categories. But obviously the most important one is how often you can actually put up a score against them. It's crazy. The Niners lead the NFL, of course, in total defense, scoring defense, interception. D'Amico Ryan's complete game changer. Uh, their pass defense, still a little suspect. We'll see what uh, Jalen Hurts can do to carve it up. Now the number 9.3. That's a weird number. What is 9.3? What could that be? 9.3 is the number of times this season that you have to pressure Patrick Mahomes in order to get him with a sack. He's hmm. the best quarterback in the NFL at avoiding sacks, but... That's when he has two healthy legs. Does that change this week now that he's got the high ankle sprain and he's going to have more difficulty getting out of that pressure? If the Bengals get pressure, are they actually going to be able to cause these negative plays that most other teams can? I just went crazy about Trey Hendrickson. Long history against Mahomes. Crushed him a bunch when he was a saint. Of course, like in these matchups against them too. Um, Sam Hubbard has three sacks over his last two games against Kansas City as well. So keep your eyes, everybody, on Sam Hubbard, the local boy. All right, last one is 158.3. What do you think? Well, you know that one, right? It's the perfect passer rating. But where is the perfect passer rating here? Joe Burrow Whoa! to Jamar Chase in two-minute situations. 
when they need plays, when they're desperate, when the time is getting down, Burrow to Chase is still absolutely money. In fact, it's a perfect passer rating. So that is the thing that the Kansas City Chiefs are going to need to stop at some point in that game. That's insane. Jamar joins, by the way, Randy Moss last week and talking about that passing game as the only other receiver to have 3,000 yards and 25-plus touchdowns in his first two seasons in the NFL. So Jamar Chase, I told you guys he's going to score a touchdown in this one, and he's going to help uh, keep that passer rating pristine and perfect for those Bengals. Sam Munson, we appreciate you. We love your work over at PFF. Uh, everybody download the PFF app. As I think I said PFF because I'm already PFF up here on a Friday. Stick around. Hamilton's got a parlay for you because he wins every parlay. Oh, for the NFL Conference Championship, Games FanDuel has an exciting offer for all customers. All customers. It doesn't matter if you're new or you already have an account because they're giving all customers, you heard me, a no-sweat same-game parlay. That means you'll get bonus bets back if your conference championship same-game parlay does not hit. But in case you want a parlay that might hit, here's Matt Hamilton. Hammer, anything you're keeping your eye on over at FanDuel Sportsbook because you are very successful at this. I'm not. <laughs> I do have a little parlay that I put together for this weekend. I talked about Patrick Mahomes and that ankle yesterday. While it does seem like it's healthier, I do expect it to still be a factor. So if you look at what I put together, I have the Bengals money line. I have, I'm taking a page out of your K-makers. I'm going with the Jamar Chase anytime touchdown. And I have Hayden Hurst over 25 yards receiving. You know, I just think with everything going on with Justin Reed, I think he uh, he turns it up and has a nice little game. I know he has that calf injury. That's something to monitor. But if he does play, I think he has a nice game. Uh, I love to hear it. Hold on. Hi, everyone. Oh, oh that's, that's here. Hold on. I wanted to play the Bengals. What is happening? I wanted to play the Bengals song. No, and is that a voicemail? <laughs> Hold on. I shut up. Everybody. I thought your voicemail box is full. But. My voicemail box has been full since 20, 2007. Uh, okay, so that's the parlay. Go check it out. Thanks for joining the show. Such good info. Such good guests. My green screen, we're working on it, everybody. We're figuring it out. Uh, Hammy, love ya. We got a big guest. We're going to the Super Bowl. You and I are going to the Super Bowl. Up and out. We're going to the Super Bowl. We're going to the Super Bowl. Enjoy it. <laughs>